mighty crowd. Right, they made the room sound full, cool, yeah? Welcome to Days of the Dead Atlanta. Okay, I want to open this up. I would love to know about you personally. I want to know about your acting and journey and how you got involved in this craft. Mm -hmm. Go back. Well, um, I was born in Bristol, England, and um, my parents uh, decided that um, they tried to build a house after the war, and it was just impossible. So they were given an opportunity to either go to Australia, where my dad didn't want to raise sheep, and or come to America. But buy in Canada, because you needed a sponsor in those days to be able to um, come over. So we went to Canada, we were in Toronto for two years, and then um, we had this fabulous Pontiac car with the Indian head on the front, and we were going to just dance it. And we drove cross country, and we ended up in um, El Segundo. So my mother didn't know anybody, and she wondered how she was going to meet people. So the landlady, said, well, you should talk to Mrs. Robinson down the hall because um, her daughter is in uh, modeling and commercials and things like that. I'm not, I don't know where my mother came up with this funk to do it, but she went down <laughs> and talked to Mrs. Robinson. And we ended up with this agent, Lola Moore, who you would go on cattle calls. Um, it just, it didn't matter. You, my, my sister and I both went on an interview for somebody of their list, which was with Pierre Angeli and Paul Newman. It was a boxing movie, and my sister was three and a half, and she got the part. I, I mean, I was three and a half years older than she was. Why was I on that interview? It a little weird in a crib. Um, <laughs> so um, it just it was just like one of those weird things. I had uh, thousands of freckles and long blonde hair, and looked totally all American and I did peanut butter curse. I was the Kellogg's girl. I did dancing with, you know, sugar snacks and waking up with the little um cockadoodle new guys and the, the snack pop uh, snack cracker pop. Oh, yeah. rice and rice crispies, <laughs> cornflakes, I mean they did them all. And um, and then I got a part in a Zangri theater when I was like Seven, maybe eight, and it was with um, Bar Barbara Stamlet, my mother, which was pretty cool. And um, they, she has to get shot on the street. It was a big western that they did, and of course they poured Hershey's syrup all over, which you know, because it was black and white. That's what they used to look was Hershey's syrup. <laughs> it was just so it was fascinating. I I just loved it. I was in. Um, tons of the um, Leave It to Beavers, I was Violet Rutherford, I did Violet Beaver's I mean, uh, First Kiss, and I actually played several parts in that. And, uh, and then I got this movie called The Children's Hour with Audrey Hepburn and Shirley MacLaine. And from that, Alfred Hitchcock saw me and cast me in The Birds. And then from then I did Spencer's Mountain. And, I don't know, I've just been doing this now for the last 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> and here we go. <laughs> now you mentioned that you looked all American. Did you happen to have an English accent like your folks or no? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, my sister, when she got Danny Trauma Show, or Make Room for Daddy, she would go, we're home now, we can be dirty again. We're, <laughs> we're home now, we can be dirty again. No, dirty. So she had to learn how to go, you know, get get rid of that. And we did, I mean, doing commercials, I just had to do that, so I didn't, but yeah, we sort of had to have it beaten out of us a little yeah. bit, but I didn't know we got ahead of it pretty soon. But then I, later on, I did a movie over in England called Inserts with Richard Rogers uh -huh. uh -huh. and um, Bob Hoskins' first movie, and um, that, I was supposed to be American, so I mean, we wish I had good citizenship, and so it was great. My former colleague loves it. It's on a huge poster. Loved me the DVD, so I watched it. And never heard it. Like, this is different. It's a really, it's wonderful. It was x rated at the yeah. time. Yeah. It's totally stupid. Um, right? It, it's just because of the word, the C word that they used. And so um, that's why it 
got, I was ready for that, yes, now it's NC-17. But we got to go to the um, Paris Film Festival, and it was really, they treated us pretty fantastic when it came out, because we shot it on a shoestring. Um, and we went all over, it was just, it was great. We won um, silver in Berlin, I think it was, so pretty cool. Wow. For a simple little movie, which was supposed to be an American house, and we just built it. All the people were contributed in props and everything. It was a wonderful movie, if none of you have seen it before. So, um, maybe the kids might know when they see it. But, um, <laughs> you're <older. laughs> Right. Well, uh, you and your work have been a part of my life since I was just a little baby. Right, and we talked about it a little bit last night, so I'm going to nerd out a little bit. Everyone's here for Alien. I'm going in a different direction. I'm going to get weird. I want to know about Baywatch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was the pilot of Baywatch. Um, my husband directed the pilot, Richard Compton. So he directed the pilot of Baywatch, and um, there was a part that needed to be, of course, the mother of Nature to me. I said, well, what about me? I'd like to go to Hawaii, because the whole thing was shot in Hawaii, and it's really cool. So, yeah, um, it was, uh, apparently, uh, my husband had a hard time, because they were going off both and shooting things like being a rug salesman for producers, uh, and uh, they had a lifeguard. Guy, and they were the ones who started doing Baywatch. And all of a sudden, the lifeguard is shooting a film of um, Parker Stevenson. And, and he got caught up in the pier, and he ended up with barnacle burns all over the back of him. Of course, nobody bothered to ask Richard. That's against director's real rules. I mean, oh, there were major problems. So that was uh, real, that was part of the storyline. So that was real? Yeah, that was real. Oh my goodness. So it was um, pretty interesting. Um, but Hawaii's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on, Touched by an Angel. A beautiful episode. It was a really beautiful episode, I thought. I, I really I enjoyed doing it, and it was one of my, um, I don't know, I felt really emotional about the whole thing. I thought it was, uh, and um, um, Patrick Flannery, what's the part? Sean. Sean Patrick Flannery plays my son, and he's executed in the piece, and we did a strange, but I did sort of the execution, I work in a dog room, and I don't know, it was very emotional. It felt really, really real. And, um, I, it was a good, good episode. Yes, it was. I, I, I may or may not own all the Touched by an Angel seasons on DVD, but I rewatched that episode um, recently, and I cried like a little baby. It still holds up. It's been 20 years. It still holds up. It does. You know? so. All right, now, horror, of course, is why we're here, and uh, I love Candyman, too. I'm Candyman, too. Can we talk about your experiences? Do you have any fun stories or not well, fun stories about Candyman, too? Um, Candyman, too, is directed by um, Bill Condon, who is just, uh, God, he's such a wonderful director. I did a thing called um, Dead in the Water with um, Bill, and um, with Brian Brown, and I was supposed to be this sort of cougar woman who was after Brian Brown. It was a boot of an episode of anybody. It's dead in the water, I mean. But, so, Bill, I, I did that um, when we did Candyman 2 for him, and I mean, it was kind of weird walking. You know, you get hooked and you have to die and stuff like that. It was like, how, how, how do you do that? You know, it was an experience, so. Because um, you're not like getting physically something you had, and I had to fall down the wall and uh, do the wall thing. It was cool. It was very cool. And then I did another movie with Bill, and so I've done three things with Bill. So what was the other one? Um, and the other one was Kinsey. What was that about? Kinsey. Um, it was about the sex. Um, Liam Neeson. My son, he's three years younger than I. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we had, um, and John Lithgow was his father. Oh, wow. well, I think he's the same age. As, you know. <laughs> it's amazing what he can do with makeup and everything like that. 
Um, and he is a sex therapist. He is the one who came out with the whole book on sex therapy and um, experimenting with masturbation and things like that. So, pretty interesting. Um, I'll tell you a, a weird story with that one. I, they had to do the fours where you were really young, which was in the uh, eight, late 1800s. And I had a dress that was a corset, you know, so that it was, well, I was Elvis and Friends, um, and, because I used to live in New York, and it was Elvis and Friends, and we went, and we had our three cocktails, <laughs> and it started to rain, which I didn't realize, and I slipped, and, and I hit a fire hydrant, and the underwire of my bra, <laughs> I broke three ribs. So, fortunately, I had a day off, so I went to St. Vincent's, when it was still there, and of course, there's nothing you can do for broken ribs. But I told our costumer, I said, broken three ribs. He goes, no one will ever know. And they put me in the corset, and they corseted me up. Well, they casted they just, you in. They, yeah, they just, they just stuck me in there, and then I had to hold a three-week-old baby. And I thought, oh, gosh, please, baby, don't wake up. Please, baby. <laughs> the baby never woke up. Oh, was I crazy? Was that going to be really bad? Wow. <laughs> so Bill never knew that happened. And then I saw Bill when I was in New York a year or so ago, and I told him that story he never knew, and Bill never told him. Oh. So that was pretty cool. Wow. So you kept your job. Kept your job. And Will and Grace. Will and Grace. That was really fun. Um, I actually was replacing somebody. Um, for that, and they had called and they showed sent me over tape. And when we shot, we had a rehearsal on the Monday, which the rehearsal was just a read through of the script from 12 o'clock till maybe 1 o'clock. And everybody went home, and then they took my measurements and everything. The next day, I went in and they got me all dressed up, we blocked everything, I, and we shot that night. So on that Tuesday night, we shot the entire scene, uh, I mean, the entire show. Wow. So I was really impressed with myself. You should be. <laughs> so had you done a lot of sitcom work before that? Um, I did a few things. I was on that, um, what was that, the, um, Leo, um, George and Leo, which was um, Judd Hirsch and um, um, Bob Hart. Oops, just passed. Yeah. And I was Jason Bateman. Mother in there. And then I didn't have much comedy. Not on I mean, stage, I think, but not on TV. But I thought I was pretty funny. You are. You are. <laughs> the show I've been writing and amazing talent, amazing guest stars. Hello. And last but not least, um, Body Snatchers, man. Home Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Such a good. Bill Cockney. Absolutely fabulous. Oh. And then I did the right stuff with Bill. And also a movie called Twisted, which was very weird, but was it twisted? It was it was very twisted. Um, but um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, we shot it all up in San Francisco, and I was supposed to run this mud baths. Yes. And <laughs> Jeff Goldman Goldberg was my husband. So uh, <laughs> this was before we even started shooting. They took us off to Dr. Barnett's, which is a mud bath. Up there, it's amazing how many people do these mud baths. I mean, there's all these people. I mean, they think it's great for you know, systems and everything. Well, they hose you down. You get naked. They hose you all down like vigorously. They put you on a huge big, which looks like a big pizza pallet, which is this big wood pallet, and they kind of go like this and shove you into this huge bath of mud. And you're sort of, okay. And then she starts throwing it on you. And she says, move around, move around. And you're like putting it on yourself. Well, I don't even know what was in there, but after all the weight is on you, you start farting. <laughs> <laughs> because of the weight and the heat. Well, as you start moving around, there's these, I was assuming they were bowl of, like, hunks of, Lava, but you weren't quite sure. <laughs> and it's this big brown mud, and you're up to your neck in it. 
moving around and this stuff it was hysterical. <laughs> then you get out of the thing and then they spray you down with another hose and then wrap you like a mummy in that thing. Well, when I came out, I mean, you're glowing. You're absolutely glowing. I come out and Jeff Goldblum comes up to the men's side and the first thing he says is, I don't know how sanitary that was. <laughs> <laughs> I knew exactly what he was talking about. Oh my God, it was, that was a trip and a half. So then we go and we, we start shooting the movie and then when they did have to buy that, they had uh, a lot skinny, uh, thinner. Yeah, uh, it wasn't say. thick like that. But um, they sent me off. I got to do um, Swedish massage, so I was doing Swedish massage on all my friends. I don't do um, Chris Chris Lloyd. <laughs> I did Swedish massage on him. And Jack Nicholson and rubbed him in front of all these people and keep giving <laughs> Swedish massage. I get down to the set and here is this enormous man. I couldn't even get my hands over the top of my side. How am I supposed to do Swedish massage on him? But it worked out okay. <laughs> so they gave you real massage training? Uh, yes, real massage yes. training. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. So aside from the mas massage training, how did you prepare for that role emotionally, physically? Did you see the original? Oh yes, the big corn clubs. Yeah, that was a bit ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, people walking around with big corn things. Stop hanging off of them. Uh, this I was think that's the homage to the original, though, of Kevin oh, McCarthy okay. running up the street in the beginning. That was a beautiful touch. Yeah, that was great. And then it's, as you watch it, you can see somebody, a uh, priest, swinging on the street. That was Robert Duvall. So all these people were kind of like little Easter egg. Right. Um, but, um, She's the one who didn't believe that, why are we always assuming that they discover metal ships? I mean, why do we assume that? I mean, they could be living amongst us, and I was the wise one. Again, here I go, alien too, nobody believes me. <laughs> um, and so, um, it was really a wonderful part. And I did not expect the end. Uh, um, and Donald Sutherland, like, he's just was a hoot and a half to work with. I was telling a couple of people, um, he insisted on having curly hair um, for this role. And so he said he had his hair set every day in pink permanent rods. So we, all of our rehearsals was dark in pink permanent rods. <laughs> it was just absurd. It's like, what are we doing here? And at lunch, of course, he had to take, he, he took a bath, and we were up in San Francisco, so it's damp, so he had to have it redone in the afternoon. So finally, about three weeks before the end of the movie, he finally got a perm. He didn't want to ruin his hair. And um, hence, twice a day, they put permanent rods in your head. But it looked cool for the part. He liked it. And he had this like curly. He was just wild. He was just he was just such a, a treat. He took uh, Brooke and myself, his women, out to um, the top of the mark and to buy a champagne. We were gonna have champagne. And so he ordered a bottle of crystal. And um, so then they come back and they said, Oh I'm sorry, sir, we don't have any crystal. He goes, all right, come ladies, thank you. Up we go, and we go off to another hotel to see if they had crystal. Send me champagne, you can possibly drink. I said, oh, okay, it's really good. Mm. It's really good. <laughs> so, yeah, he was, he was just wild. And he's so gangly, he was so gangly. <laughs> and running downstairs, everybody had their heart in their throat thinking, oh my God, is he gonna fall over or something? Because he's just like a big, Gangly giraffe. I mean, he was unbelievable. He was, but he was very cool. Everybody was very cool on that movie. It was great. Any memories of Leonard Nimoy? Leonard, I didn't have that much with Leonard. I had two scenes with Leonard. But he was very nice. He was very nice, totally composed, and, and just he was very sweet. So. The alien time. <laughs> you were going to ask a question? No, I was just having a Oh, you were having a <laughs> yeah. oh, All right. I thought that was a question. He's an eager alien. Yeah. <laughs> How did Alien come into your life? What was your audition like for that? Well, I auditioned actually in L.A. Um, for the part with Berkeley. And um, then um, I was going over to England. 
And so I said to um, my agent, would you check and see if that part is gone? Because if it hasn't, I'd like to audition in England. So I did. I went in and I auditioned for Ridley in England. Again, as Ridley. Um, and then came back to the States. And then I found out that I got it. I assumed through the part of Ridley. <laughs> <laughs> Much to my surprise, I get over there and um, I went with my boyfriend who was Jack Nicholson, chef. They were doing um, Shining over there. And um, so we, his mother had an apartment there. So we go over and I'm staying there and I get a call from the wardrobe department that said they want me to come in and do my wardrobe for, uh, for Rick Lambert. And I said, no, I, I'm Ripley. And he said, no, you're a Lambert. Mm. I said, mm. all right, let me find out about this. I called my agent. He said, no, you're Ripley. Then I called the producers and I said, I never even read this part from, you know, the script from the part of that crybaby. <clears throat> and so I would have to reread the script again. So I reread it and I thought, well, I have to find a good her being a crybaby. So, if you think about it, she's the only wise one. She says, you know, let's, let's draw straws, let's get off the ship. What the, if the, you know, the shuttle's too small for all of us, let's see who can be in there. Um, so, I think she was, she was pretty wise. And, and, you know, I ended up with being Lambert, but I'm understanding that she's sort of what the audience was doing. So, yeah. I am the voice of the audience, in case you didn't know that. <laughs> I remember my son is here. And um, I remember he, he wanted to watch it. He was 11 years old. He decided he'd watch it in the morning. It took him three mornings to watch it. <laughs> and as you see, he's six, seven now. So, uh, but that was always so. Well, uh, you know, you get to the breakfast scene, you go, well, I think I'll watch the rest of it tomorrow. And so then the next morning you come out and you watch a little bit more. Finally you got through it and then you watch the whole thing. But I think just the thought of it was, you know, too yeah. much. Or <laughs> well, we were never given a premiere for it. I mean, it was very odd. I mean, the whole, it was a tough shoot. It was very tough. I mean, those sets were enormous and everything was connected. I mean, you, when you spaceship, you had the engine room. You had to walk through the engine room to get to the cafeteria part and to the uh, hospital part. It was very claustrophobic. And, um, but uh, it, was, it was tough shoot, but it was worth it, I guess. Yeah. Everybody seems to be really pleased with it. You have a legacy. I have a legacy. Yeah, we have one right there. Yeah, uh, I want to know if you have any behind the scenes stories, any or all stories about the real hero of the film, Jonesy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I didn't work with that cat. No. <laughs> no, that wasn't my thing. <clears throat> but I was supposed to, they never shot my death. And my death was supposed to be up in the locker, like this locker that he used to hide in, go up into the locker, Jonesy. That was supposed to be my death, and the alien was supposed to drag me out. But we never shot it. Instead, a couple weeks later, because I kept saying, when are we shooting my death? And they had me hung on a meat hook with um, you know, a lovely jock strap. <laughs> um, that they insisted that they wanted us to wear at one point, the point where the, the little thing opens up, you know, and we're all now in little white boxers. <laughs> and um, they want not to be the model for this horrible thing. So I guess they figured they had to get some use out of it. Um, and that was interesting because here we shot it and then all of a sudden somebody comes along and says, well, we lose six countries if we see women's nipples. Aww. So they stuck white tape around from Sigourney and myself. And so that nobody, we lost India, we lost all these major yeah. things if they saw nipples on the woman. Wow. Is that insane? That is just <laughs> totally nuts. Well, try to get that damn tape off. <laughs> <laughs> In a hot, sweaty thing. That was not pleasant. <laughs> Did you just think ripping off the oh, uh, yeah. slow process? <laughs> you had to rip. <laughs> uh, 
was terrible. Anyway, uh, but I don't have any real stories. Of and your son's like, Mom! <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's okay. He knows me. Um, <laughs> yeah? You a Giger on set? Yes, Giger was on set. And what was he like? And um, he was very weird. <laughs> um, he um, would always wear black, always wear black. And he had a cape that had purple lining. And um, he was uh, he was originally, the first time he saw him, was putting on the suit um, for Balaji, who was our alien, who was seven foot tall. Like, he was from the Maasai tribe, so his arms were so long, and his hands were like below his kneecaps. And so by the time he put the gloves on, and then they would have been in like that. Well, of course, he had to walk around in the suit. Actually, Tom is the one who said, he needs to be able to sit down, and suggested building a swing. They had a special swing so that Balaji could sit down. And then he had enormous feet, and he'd always be wearing crisp white chemis or blue chemis. I didn't hear it. <laughs> so we would have this alien thing with big white chemis <laughs> on the bottom. It was just terrible. Um, but Ego was around a lot of the time, and um, just making sure that it, cause all of those sets were him. I mean, it, they gave us a whole set of prints, which was really nice at the end, and they were all numbered. But what was I going to do? Where am I going to put those? Big vaginas hanging on the wall? <laughs> I felt, no, this isn't really my cup of tea. So I did so. But I got $9,000 for them. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I always heard the rumor that you were not told about the chest burst or scene so the reaction would be real. So my question is, was that really true? And if so, how in God's name did you not frick character? Well, um, <laughs> it was in the script, that, you know, and actually we needed to see what it looked like because Sigourney and I were supposed to have a scene together where it's supposed to have already come out. So they took us down to the puppet shop and showed us the um, little puppet guy. Of course, he wasn't in the same color or anything, and the, they were so excited. Oh, what's gonna read? What, what you gonna read? You know, and they're there with the cups and the thing. And, the, and it's gonna have teeth, and those teeth, you think, oh, well, that's exciting. But at least we knew what we were talking about. So then we, when we were left up in the dressing room for hours, four or five hours, we worked for lunch, and then we had to go back up in the dressing room, Harry Dean was sitting in the hallway playing the guitar. And everybody was like, what the hell is going on? Finally, they take us down. And John was there with a, a fake chest. And of course, it was stuffed with awful, all sorts of guts and stuff. But what our, our initial thing was, you got onto the, it was all draped in plastic. Everything was plastic. And this big bucket of awful was there, which made you gag as you walked in. Anyway, we get it. There's four cameras. Everybody has raincoats on. A little suspicious. Um, and we, they started to shoot. They said, okay, this will be coming through. And of course, what the reactions were, 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 were not. They were. But what happened was they started to shoot, and then really shouts, cut. And he comes in, and he has them cut a little bit more on the on the t-shirt where the thing is supposed to come through. I mean, you got a guy on a skateboard and stuff underneath the table, I think it's just, anyway, you don't see any of that, or you see it. Well, I became so fascinated because of the clump out, I went right into a bloodshed, and it hit me square in the face, hence, oh my God. And then I backed up. It looked like a Max Sennett movie. It was like, da, 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 and then I disappeared. Because my knees hit the bank heads. I flipped over the back of the bank head. I had two cowboy boots sitting up, and I thought, oh my God, they're still shooting. I rolled over and ran back in. But we got to go see the Russians on that. And apparently it has now been on it. Some, you know, when they do the outtakes and stuff, it's on the newest version of that alien movies. It, so ridiculous. Bum, bum, bum. And then I disappeared. Disappeared. No, it was, so, I mean, yes, I mean, I, you sort of knew that you were in the scene and that was not planned at all. Mm -hmm.
Anyway, oh, one final thing about bridges of Easton. When I fall down the stairs, I had worked with our Rochester, who was our sound man before, and we were having lunch, and he had decided to have ribs. And so then he says to me, you know, it'd be fun if we put the rib on, on your leg, and then we, you know, you could pretend that something has happened when you do the fall. So we do, we, we ended up doing the scene, and the, the camera's up above, and then Cher and uh, Susan, the, they're all up on here, and then this camera comes in, and it goes down, and then they shoot the thing. And George goes, you know, it just doesn't look real enough. I said, Art has ribs for lunch. <laughs> so that's what they did. And I had been in an accident in 1981 where I had scars on both sides of my leg, and, my, and a bone came out of my leg. So I said, well, I know where to place it. So they placed it right there and they put our lunch on my leg. <laughs> so it looks like the bone came out. Oh. And the interesting thing when I was in that accident, it was amazing how controlled I was. I didn't scream, I didn't cry, I saw the bone, I knew it wasn't, wasn't right. I picked up my leg and pulled as hard as I could to pull the bone back in. So when that whole scene happened, and I say, I think I broke my leg. Uh, it just, there wasn't a panic. And I thought, well, I guess I was in that accident for a reason because that's how you act, you know? So, so many weird things. It's the same thing with Amy. It's your nervous system protecting you. Yeah, I guess so. Because, if, you know, you go in a state of shock. Mm -hmm. And so the shock takes over and you, you just start acting very reasonably. That guy, that asshole, um, he, he was backing his car up, so it looked right that he hadn't driven me off the road because um, he wanted to pick up a hooker and saw a hooker. And, and she was praying for me. I said, Oh, fuck the thing, get out of there and, you know, get him to stop moving the car. <laughs> so I mean, it was totally ridiculous. And he was an anesthesiologist, too. Yep. So they assumed he was right. And then it ended up we couldn't find him. We, um, I had to go and have all the screws and everything taken out about a year and a half later, two years later, and go to Lucy's Andrade, which was this famous French restaurant. So it was a taco uh, Mexican restaurant. And um, we had gone there, and I'm standing in line, and my husband looks at me and he goes, what's the matter? I said, that's him. And he walked into the restaurant. I, I just, I guess, all the blood drained from my face. So we kept an eye on him and we followed him like Nick and Laura Charles. <laughs> and we tracked him down and we called the detectives and they tracked him down and he had sold everything, got rid of it. He had been doing operations without talking to people, plea offs, nothing. Drunk on the job. Yeah. Really, and I wasn't allowed to bring any of that out with arbitration because it took so long to get. But and I lost two jobs. I was doing a movie for HBO and a play, and and so I lost both of those jobs doing while this asshole had just disappeared. So anyway, but all things work out for a reason, and I got riches of Eastwood, and a great story. <laughs> that was my reaction, which I wouldn't have known if I, you know, you never know how you're going to react. I saw another here somewhere. Was it you? Yeah. Um, you just signed an action figure of yourself for me. Oh yes. How does it feel to be to see yourself, you know, and in, in video games and shows and? Well, I'd like to get paid for it. Oh, I don't. We we shot that movie in what 1978. Nobody thought. It was 13 years later, wasn't it? 13 years later that um, what's his name did the sequel, Cameron did mm -hmm. the sequel. So. I mean, nobody thought at the time of doing action figures or anything like that. So it's kind of cool to yeah. see it. There is one of these screaming, I, I know. My son went to try and find it, they're all sold out. We'll I don't have one. We'll find one for you. <laughs> Um, well, 
I actually got to see Rod Serling do his piece. He apparently did it every week. Really? He comes in, he sits on that stool, and he was kind of behind a curtain, and so I got to watch him do his little spiel for that particular episode. That was cool, because I used to watch it. But apparently he came in every week and did one. So that was cool. And smoking a cigarette. I mean, unbelievable. You never had a cigarette out of this. No. Um, so, but it was, a, it was a fun experience doing that. So. And there's one back there. Uh, I was going to ask if you had any um, memories or of your experiences working with Audrey Hepburn. Um, yeah. Well, that movie, The Children's Hour, was very special. She was lovely. She had a, a little Yorkie Terrier in her yard that she used to walk around with all the time. Um, she was very, um, didn't talk much, just very, very sweet and kind. And, and um, the one that got me, though, was Cheryl McLean. So she was sort of my inspiration for even staying in the business and wanting to do it. Um, it was interesting doing that part because, of course, I don't know if you've all seen it, but it's about lesbians. And um, my mother, we used to take little acting classes, and, and um, I had a Frank White up and, and Bill Lockwood. And Bill Lockwood used to do the musicals and the singing classes and stuff like that. And um, so a lot of people pulled their kids out of that movie because of what the subject matter was. And my mom said to us, this was 1961, which she was Catholic, and it was pretty amazing. She goes, well, it's just like Frank and Bill on the two women. Now, that was pretty amazing for that period of time. Well, it occurred to me that, that I didn't see anything wrong with that, and I love Frank and Bill, so that seemed all right. So when I do tell the law, I'm actually telling the law. But um, Shirley McLean, um, when I had a big breakdown scene, she, she came over and she hugged me and she goes, oh, that was so wonderful, honey. And, and she just sort of, I, I remember sitting and watching her do a wardrobe. And she was on a sort of a, a, a pedestal thing where she, she would have to turn slowly so that they could even see it. Because those are the days they used to put everything on film so they could see what the costume looked like and everything like that. And she was cracking the crew up. She was talking to the crew. We were told not to hang out by Shirley because she was bad language. But I just thought that was so fascinating. And she, everybody just loved her. The crew loved her. And I thought, that's, that's what you've got to do. So years later, I am doing a play in Hollywood um, on Hollywood Boulevard, and they had the Christmas parade. And um, I had had a dream about showing the fan. It was so weird. Of on the end of a big swimming pool in Las Vegas for some reason. And I remember walking down there and I said to her, you are the reason I'm doing what I'm doing. So here I'm doing this play. She's doing a one-woman show down on Wilshire Boulevard. And it was Christmas parade, so they had to shut the Hollywood and buy now. So I thought, I'm going to go see her show. So after the show, which she was sensational, after the show, I went back and I said I'd really like to see your show in the phone. And he would be there years ago. And they said, well, you're not on the list. I said, well, she had lunch with So they went back, and Shirley's standing there, and she looked at me, and she says, I have followed your career. I mean, oh my God, it was like just, it was just something really special. So, yeah, she was cool. So it was really Shirley. And did, you, I, did you say what you dreamt you would say? Oh, I did. Well, no, I, I dreamt, I, I told her about the dream. And I thought, this is really weird, because she has all that book about dreams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought, this is really appropriate. <laughs> anyway, but sure, um, Audrey Hepburn was very sweet. I mean, I didn't have that much interaction with her, but except for this couple of scenes that we had together. So, and that little Yorkie. <laughs> Anyone else up there? Right there. So um, I know that in the in the movie Alien, you and uh, Sigourney's characters had a bit of an animosity towards each other because uh, she didn't want to let you onto the ship because Amy was that good, and you wanted to be let onto the ship. And I know there's a deleted scene like where you slap her, mm -hmm. and I also know that.
how you mentioned that you grew up in a world where you she got her success. Was there any real life animosity between the two of you? No, we shared the dressing. Um, uh, no, but what was interesting about that scene, which was cut out, it wasn't in the original, but it was in the director's cut. Yeah. Um, every time I went to slap her, I, uh, she would duck. <laughs> so I would go like this and then she duck. And Ridley comes over, this was like three or four times. And it just, he says, you can just thin it this time. Yeah. So I said, okay. So I went like that and she ducked and I'm back. And <laughs> like she went right into it and oh my God, instant tears and oh, she was. <laughs> well, we got to the scene, and um, so it worked. I mean, it worked. Yeah. I was pissed off at her yeah. for not letting us on. Did you stay in contact? Or? No, every once in a while. I, she came to see a play I did in New York. Um, okay. But just, um, well, actually, we didn't get along so well. <laughs> That's what I was wondering. <laughs> And um, so I got a call. I, I don't know. I was in New York visiting friends, and I don't know how she got the phone number. She called and apologized because I told her I thought she was being an asshole, and that she just thought she was better than any of us. And there were only seven of us, and you know, you, she really didn't have the right to do that. And she called and apologized. And she said, "You're absolutely right." We ended up having to do several tours we went to Chicago and different places. And so, I mean, all things, I guess, are for a reason, you know? So, yeah, and it was, well, because she was brought in, nobody knew who she was. She'd never done anything before. And um, she was just sort of very new. And, and, um, but everything worked out for the best. So. Being that you, you wanted to Ripley, Was there a particular Ripley scene that you really were dying to do that you wanted to do? Um, I can't remember what the scenes were. We had to do several scenes, and they were all Ripley. I mean, that's all I auditioned with. I can't really remember what they were um, now because I ended up being Lambert. There's no, is there you know, one can't that cry over still milk. I'm like, sorry? Is there one that, like, if you're positioned to work, you, you said that I really wish I had been no, I didn't probably to think of it after I became Lambert. Yeah. Yeah. I know, you went to it. How did you become involved with the invasion with Nicole Kidman and Daniel Craig? Um, actually, um, Oliver Hirschbeagle, who was the director, um, he requested meeting me. And um, so I went down and I met him and we just talked. And I didn't have to read any scenes or anything, but I mean, in a weird sort of way, she could have easily have been Nancy and you know, darkened her hair and just, and just sort of melted into humanity. And then all of a sudden, there's her husband, you know, going off the deep end. So, um, and, but it was Oliver who requested, and it was so funny because Daniel Craig is drawn. And he had gone off, he just become, he, he was off auditioning for Bond. I don't know how many times he had to do that. And he came back and he found out when we were shooting that he was going to be James Bond. So that was kind of cool. He likes martinis. <laughs> and I had a couple of martinis together. So um, he's just a sweetie. And it turned out he looked very close to where I am. So let me run into you at Trader Joe's. <laughs> um, so, but the, you know, the movie has two directors, and it was all of our, and then I don't know what happened, but they ended up getting somebody who had done the Matrix, like the original Matrix, I think. I think it was the Matrix. And he came in, an Australian director. And I don't know what they did. They reshot scenes and stuff like that. They reshot my scene and all these different scenes, and it looks kind of lopsided, I think, the movie. I don't know whether. Um, we found that. Um, like the grocery store scene was, it's just, it seems like there were parts and then other parts, and it was like two different movies somehow. So, I don't know, I don't think it did very well, did it? <laughs> Boo. <laughs> okay, last couple of questions before I wrap us up. 
in the back. On the birds, did uh, you celebrate a birthday on the birds? I did, my thirteenth birthday on the birds. And um, it was right after we shot the scene where all the little finches come down, and 1,500 of those little birds coming down in their sheets. We were all in a big plastic bubble with an oxygen tank, you know, and then the birds were on, in a shack in the chimney. And they were all set down, and then they were just flying everywhere, and they'd be all scooped up and we'd shoot it again. Well, it was that day, of course, I was very, I was very emotional. And they take me to a, another part of the set, and the entire crew's there, a huge big cake, and Alfred Hitchcock, and Jessica gave me a sweater, and Tiffy gave me one birds, and, um, and then um, Alfred said to his assistant, Peggy, and she handed him a piece of white board with a black crayon, and he wrote, to the woman I love, with Veronica, and then drew his face and signed it. So I had that in my, my office. Very cool. He, I loved him. I thought he was terrific. He couldn't have been funnier. He was nice and it, it, totally unintimidating. I could ask him questions about how things were done. Um, and he just would stand there and he'd explain it, like walking out of the uh, at the end of the movie when we're all walking out of the door. There was no door. And I said, well, <laughs> there's no door. He says, well, how would I shoot you up there? Because can't have a door or would be able to see him. So he says, let's show it, Rod. So Rod Taylor mimes the whole thing and he leans down, he sort of turns the knob and he goes like this and this shaft of light goes on her face and then all of a sudden it's light. And he says, you see, Veronica, that's the magic of movies. I mean, I mean, just, I don't know, he was never intimidating. I could ask anything about the birds on the jungle gym or birds on the wires. So many of them were fake, and that there were all sorts of real birds, too. And I said, well, people notice me. He goes, well, your eye sees movement, and you assume everything is a lie. And to this day, you can watch that jungle gym. You know you can't pick out the ones that are fake and which ones aren't. I mean, your eye does tricks for you. It's the same thing in Psycho. You never saw a body being stabbed. You just assumed it. There was all those quick cuts, and you know, I mean, your imagination does all the work, and that's, that was a big thing for him. And when we did Alien, Ridley was studied Alfred Hitchcock. So that stuff was like Alfred Hitchcock. You never see that in Alien when you do Alien. It's just something. What is that? What's up in that rack? There's parts of it. You never see it until the end. Yeah, no. And then yeah. it's all of a sudden, uh, you, you built up such anxiety about what it is. And one of the scariest things is the one where she's in the shuttle at the end, and he's right behind her. And all the pipes and everything like that, and then he just steps out. <laughs> That's really scary. That's really, that was great. But Elijah was unbelievable. He could twist himself into positions with that suit on. And that huge cat. At one point, they wanted to put maggots in there, like brain. And he goes, well, I'm not sticking one on my head. I broke the one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Enough is enough. And they have big boxes of blue and red and white maggots. And, uh, and they show a shot of it, but if they weren't to put it on his head, he said, forget it. Uh, I'm paying enough to do that. All right, last audience uh, question. Gentlemen in the hat right there, yeah. But George was great. George was a lot of fun. I, you know, I, I, no, I don't really have a favorite. I worked three times with Phil Kaufman. He's absolutely divine. Um, he really knows how to work with actors, which is really great. Um, Ridley never really talked to us the whole time he did. At the, we were pieces of um, scenery that he sort of moved around. Ridley's eye is to do visual. And so he just got a really great cast together and could trust us, you know, and um, to do things. Um, that was our directions, you know, like it's, I couldn't slap her and just fucking get her this time. Or to, to you know, to laugh at him and say, just piss her off, piss her off. And so um, the scene where, <laughs> it's terrible because I love things like this. Um, 
the scene where she's now, Dallas is dead and she's now captain of the ship. And uh, so she came in and there had originally been sort of a little intimate scene between them and two. And they decided they just didn't need it. So it wasn't even shot. And, um, but she was coming off of that. And Don captain of the ship and she was very weepy and everything. And we all thought we just banged down the seven and went, oh, fuck you. And then he'd walk off. And so he just didn't you know, start giving her more and more pissed off. I mean, at one point he says, I'm black as can be. And I have an entire following. And you're standing there saying, I can be a captain of this ship. Oh, he just is terrible. She's just getting angrier and angrier. So finally he comes in and she, she says, I am the captain of the ship and this is what's happening. And if you watch the movie, he slams the gun down and he goes, okay. I mean, <laughs> his direction was, this her off. That was his direction. I mean, things like that would happen all the time. That was with me how he directed. So, um, I finally got to talk to him. <laughs> but they were worried to shut because he didn't talk very much. He was just, I mean, he, worked, he would work constantly. I mean, hours and hours. It was the only set I've ever been on where people struck. The entire crew was struck. Mm -hmm. They gave them a week's warning. They said, we're shutting down at 5.30 on Friday night, so just so you know, because we, they all they had, they had to wrap in an hour to wrap up, and then they had to drive an hour and an hour and a half to get home. We were out at Shepherd and the Studios. It wasn't near anybody. And uh, so that night came along, and they waited until the scene was finished. And then they said, okay, boys, and everybody just started wrapping up. And producers came flying down. What are you doing? What are you doing? They said, no, this is what we told you. We're taking our time. And, um, and they said, well, Ridley's willing to work. They just looked at me and Ridley's always willing to work. So, <laughs> you know, um, it, that was an interesting looking at the work. But I did the right stuff. Did everybody see the right stuff? Um, and that was Phil Kaufman, and uh, uh, what a wonderful movie that was, and what great people, and just, I don't know, we had so much fun on that movie. I don't know, I can't pick pick favorites, it just, each guy has a different, or woman, I worked with a wonderful woman director, and we did The Good Doctor, and she's terrific, and she had him come and do the rookie for her, and, and each person sort of brings their own um, meaning to it. So, I haven't worked with any real people. Well, that's good. So, that's good. So, one last question to wrap us up before we let you go, and that is mine. Oh. <laughs> if you, Robert, could give your uh, character, Amber, one piece of advice, what would it be? Well, I don't know. I think she was pretty in control of herself. I mean, she seemed weak to me. But um, I don't know that she was really that weepy because she was trying, she was frustrated. She was just trying to get people to listen to her. You know? Instead, they all kicked her bucket. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody listens. <laughs> anyway. Hey, right, guys, thank you. Give it up.